everybody. I want to invite you to pray with me as we begin our message for the day. Discover what the Lord has for us. Let's bow our heads. Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the healing that you provide for us through your son, Christ Jesus. Lord, in your word, you say that you restore our soul completely, not only spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and also physically. Lord, I pray today as we open your word, Lord, that we would see you high and lifted up, be drawn closer to you. May we see what you desire for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's a little boy who had lost his parents and was living with his grandmother. And one evening, while they were home, their house caught on fire. He was upstairs and his grandmother was downstairs. And while she was trying to get upstairs to rescue him, She could not get through the flames, and so she lost her life. The boy was screaming and crying at the top of his lungs, and finally his cries for help were heard by a man that was outside of the house who, when he heard the cry, decided to climb up an iron drain pipe. And he climbed up that drain pipe and was able to rescue that boy And he came back down with that little boy clinging to his neck. Several weeks later, they said that the town, they had a public hearing to determine who would receive custody of this child. In the room that individuals who were staking claims to this little boy was a farmer, a teacher, and even one of the town's wealthiest citizens. And all of them got up in the, in the court that day and they gave all of the reasons why they felt that the boy should be chosen to go home with them. But strangely, as they talked, the little boy never looked up from the ground. The entire time he had like this blank stare as these people fought about who would be able to take him home. And finally, uh, man came into the room, a stranger that nobody knew, and he slowly took his hands out of his pockets, revealing the scars on his hands. The crowd began to gasp, and suddenly the little boy looked up and cried out in recognition because he realized that was the man that had rescued him and climbed up the pipe. You see, the man had burned his hands climbing up the pipe to rescue that little boy. And so when he came into the courtroom, he showed everybody his hands and the little boy ran to him and just clinged to him tightly. When the little boy did that, everybody else just silently walked away. Because only this rescuer had the right to claim this little boy's life. And I want to suggest to you today, my brothers and sisters, that there are many things, many people, many temptations that try to claim the right for control and rulership in our lives. But there is only one. Who deserves that right? And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that deserves our love and devotion. Amen? Amen. Amen. So today I want to talk to you about what love, what type of devotion does Jesus require of us who belong to him. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to read from the New King James Version of the Bible. Verses 19 through 20. I want to read again what was read in our scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The city of Corinth was the largest and the most prosperous city in the region. It was nestled perfectly between two coasts, the Aegean and the Mediterranean coastlines. It quickly became the most important commercial center in all of Greece. Its location between two harbors as well as two mainlands invited large crowds of travelers, merchants, sailors, businessmen, and people from all walks of life, which ultimately caused the city to be a melting pot of religions, cultures, and beliefs. Corinth was known for its wealth and its artistry, its infatuations with the gods, and their unrestrained, indulgent sexuality. The city of Corinth was a place where you could do whatever you wanted as long as it seemed right to you. It was a culture of anything goes. For nearly 18 months, Paul, who writes this letter, labored in the city of Corinth preaching the gospel. And as a result, many came to faith in Christ, forming the first and only Christian community, the only Christian congregation in the entire city. However, by the time he writes the letter, it has been over three and a half years since the last time he has seen them. And since then, a lot has changed and sin now runs rampant in the congregation. Paul is deeply troubled and gravely concerned because the members don't see their behaviors as sinful no matter how scandalous they are. One believer is having an affair with his father's wife. Others are still participating in the practices of false religions they claim to have abandoned by eating food sacrificed to idols. There is confusion about the marriage relationship and the appropriate grounds for divorce. They are suing one another and they're even fighting over who has the best spiritual gift. Paul in this passage clearly identifies the root cause, the reason why they are behaving the way that they are. The reason why they are still slaves to sin and not slaves to Jesus Christ. It is because, hear me now, they have not fully comprehended the work Christ performed at their baptism when he placed his indwelling spirit to live inside of their hearts. You see, they didn't understand Paul's teaching about if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And because they do not understand the implications of their baptism, what it means for Christ to live inside of their hearts, Paul says to them, and do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? In other words, Don't you know that God in Christ has set you apart 
and made you holy by coming to live inside of you. Don't you know that because God lives inside of you through his Holy Spirit, you are required to live a holy life. You see, they did not realize that the baptism, their baptism, that baptism only marks the beginning of a life of holiness. Baptism is the beginning of a lifelong journey of walking with God that is characterized by daily surrender to his will. They, didn't fully under, under, they did not fully understand the full implications of their commitment to Christ, nor had they realized God was calling them to a life exclusively devoted to him. And because they did not understand the true nature of their commitment to him, and because they did not understand that, that God was calling them to live their life only devoted to, them, to him, they did not feel compelled to honor him with their bodies. And so they engaged in every vile sexual practice they did whatever suited their taste and desires, totally disregarding the Spirit of God living inside of them. Paul reveals the scope of the authority the Holy Spirit has at baptism in the life of every believer. Notice what he says. He says, you are not your own. In other words, when you gave your hearts to Christ, you surrendered the rights of control to him. And we can no longer live as we please. We no longer have the authority to decide what's best for us, how we're going to live, where we're going to live, who we're going to marry. We don't have the right to chart our own course, to live our own truth, to decide what sin is or what sin is not for us. Or do we have the right to decide even what we will eat or not eat? While God gives us the free will to choose, he wants us to choose what he knows is best for us. And what really Paul is advocating and really what the Holy Spirit is looking for in the life of the believer and really the right that he has, the, the authority that he has, is that the relationship is so intimate that really we should be asking God for permission for everything we do, even down to the level of what we eat. Because we're only as submitted to him as we are in every area of our lives. Our submission is only to the extent. And so what God is saying is that really the relationship that we should have with him is one where we're asking him for permission just like a child asks his parents for permission. You know, it's interesting. My sons, the new thing that they like to do now is they love going to the library. That sounds real good, doesn't it? Huh? But you know what my kids love going to the library? Not because there's some book in there they can't wait to get their hands on and read. But this, they have games in this library. You know, they have iPod tablets that they can go in and play different games. And so at first they would, they would just ask after school, can we go to the library today? But now every morning when they wake up, one of the first things they're asking is, can we go to the library? Now they understand that when they get to the library, they got to do their schoolwork. They've got to read for at least 30 minutes, right? That's what the teacher tells us that we got to do. That's what we should do with our kids. And so what we begin to understand, what I understand is they understand that they have to ask for permission to even go to the library. But here it is. It goes, it goes even further than that. Our children have to ask for permission for when they want to ride their bikes outside. They have to ask for permission when they want to get on the computer. They have to ask for permission when they want to turn on the television. They have to ask for permission when they want to hang out with their friends. They even have to ask for permission for even what they have to wear. They have to ask for permission for what they eat. 
they have to ask for permission. Why? Because they're my children, and I know what's best for them. Hmm? And so sometimes they question, why can't we do this? Or why shouldn't we do this? But they don't understand that I have experienced, that me and, his, me and their mother have experienced, and we know all what lies ahead of them if some of these behaviors are not corrected even now. And so what I'm trying to understand, what I'm trying to show to you today is that number one is that God wants us to have a relationship with him like that of a little child. Oh, I know that's hard for some of us. Hear me now. Hear me now. Hmm? To think about it for a moment, that even before we go somewhere, if we, we decide, it's to the point now, where my walk with God, where I ask him permission, even if there's a conference that I want to go to, I have to ask the Lord, I want to go, but do I have permission to go? Because the understanding is, is that I am not in control of my life. I don't know what's best for me. He might have another agenda for me. But think about it for a moment. Those of you who had children and or raised a little one, sometimes the kids are not able to see what you have in store for them. Hmm? So while, while my kids are complaining about what they don't have, they don't know what's on their mother and father's Christmas list four months ahead. And that is how it is our relationship with God. We don't understand just how much God has in store for us and that we could never begin to understand or fathom what he's trying to do because our, our mindset is too limited. And so there are some things that he knows are not good for us and we need his permission. This is the kind of relationship God designed for us to have with him. Where we recognize the full scope of his authority. Now, he doesn't want us to submit for the sake of his control. But he wants us to submit because we know that he knows what's best. And hear me now. Whenever a believer is operating as the captain of their own soul, then they're operating outside of their jurisdiction. Hmm? Hmm? Y'all not with me today? The moment we initiate anything that we did not get clearance from Jesus, then we are operating outside of his sovereign control. Paul gives the reason why we no longer have the right to decide what's best for us. He says, it is because you were bought with a price. Hmm? The word here for bought was used to signify the purchase of a slave from their slave master. And the meaning that Paul is trying to convey is that Christ freed us from the slavery of Satan by purchasing us with his precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Hmm, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, he says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You notice what he says. He says a life before Christ, a life without Christ is an empty way of life. Yes, and so he says that Christ has bought us back from Satan with his own blood. Jesus paid the highest price imaginable and nothing or no one will ever be able to take us out of his hand. We belong to him and him alone, and we are obligated to do what he says. Jesus says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does 
the will of my Father. Jesus is saying that those who make it into the kingdom will be those who are submitted to his will in every area of their life, even when we don't want to be. So God is concerned even about how we treat our bodies. It is clear from Paul's words that the Corinthians did not understand that receiving Christ and his spirit demands a new way of living that is totally different from the culture of the world because, and because of this, they did not live their lives as temples of the Holy Spirit. You see, there are many believers, we don't understand that when we are baptized, it doesn't mean that now I'm okay with God, let me get up and go do whatever I want to do. It means that when you're baptized, the act of baptism is the relinquishing of control. For when you are baptized, the, it's the pastor and the elder that puts you down in the water and puts you back up, symbolizing the relinquishing of control to Jesus Christ. So when you are raised back up, you're raised back up in the power of Jesus Christ. And because he now lives inside of us, we don't have the right to live in any way we please, even in the way that we treat our bodies. It is clear from Paul's words that the Corinthians did not yet understand this. And then Paul goes on, he reveals that the reason why we do not honor God with our bodies, it is because we have no real appreciation of the holiness of God. That is why he says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? For he understands that the presence of God in us demands that we respond with acts of submission and obedience. Moses, when he saw God in the burning bush, he hides his face and he obeys God's command and takes off his sandals. When Joshua encounters Jesus at Jericho, he falls down, put his face in the ground and obeys his command to take off his sandals. And we see now, hear me, whenever we come into the presence of God, it always leads to the submission of the life. Which, by the way, is what it means to truly worship him. Any worship that is not accompanied by the submission of the life to God in Christ, then it is not worship after all. It is just form. It is this fashion. And the mistreatment or the ill treatment of our bodies is a sign that we have not fully submitted our lives lives to Jesus Christ and our failure to submit to Christ and his care for our bodies has eternal implications. Hmm? It's not something to be taken lightly. How we care for our body, God does not view it as something to be taken lightly. I want to read um, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 17. Let's go there quickly. First Corinthians 3, verse 17. Notice what he says. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Hmm? Now really get to understand to have even greater understanding of this. The Jewish temple, the actual physical temple, um, and the word there for defile can be corrupted or destroyed. The Jewish temple could be defiled when anyone damaged anything in the temple, even in the slightest way. If anything was mishandled or broken, then the temple was defiled. That's how sacred the temple was, right? The temple was also corrupted if the guardians, if the priests neglected their duties. 
to the temple. And so it is with us when we neglect to take care of the temple of God that God has given us. We are sinning against him and his spirit. One of the ways we neglect to care for our bodies is when we do not follow the eight laws of health. Hmm? You know what the eight laws of health are? Number one is what? Nutrition. Hmm? That means having a proper diet, eating a plant-based diet. Oh, it's going to get real quiet in here today. Mm -hmm. Do you know that, <laughs> and hey, I'm preaching to myself here today, you know what I mean? Hmm? <laughs> hmm? Most of the illnesses, and we know this, are because of an improper diet. Diabetes? Improper diet. And diabetes is sinister because, you know, I, I, I often visit people who are, they may have one major complication going on, but because of the complications from their diabetes, they, the doctors can't even treat what's really going on. Are y'all with me? And so what we understand is what Jesus has really set up in the, in the Bible that really God is calling his people to a plant-based lifestyle. <laughs> I'm not getting any amen, Sister Robinson. <laughs> ah. hmm? Right? And we have to, God has to convict us and bring us to that place, right? Right? Okay. Right? God has to bring us to the, he brought He brought me to that place. <laughs> he had to be extreme with me to get my attention. Hmm? But it doesn't have to be that way with everybody. Right? It's a plant-based diet. God is calling us to that. Exercise, we know this, right? Walking, getting good air, right? Drinking water, right? Simple things, simple things. Water flushes out all the toxins, right? Sunshine, there, there's healing properties in the sun. It, it helps your teeth. Y'all not with me today. Hmm? The sun is able to penetrate deep into our body and provide nutrients just by walking in the sun. Hmm? Temperance. Oh, you're not with me today. Hmm? So not just, just because it's a Sabbath don't mean you just can eat yourself until you fall asleep. Hmm? Hmm? I'm guilty of it. Or because it's Thanksgiving. Hmm? You know, when I was a little boy growing up, I loved buffets, particularly the old country buffet. And I mean, literally, I would, they would have to almost carry me out of there before I left. That's how much I just, I just kept on eating because in my mind, I'm going to get my money's worth, right? <laughs> Gluttony. <laughs> That's what it was, right? And so God is calling us to a life of really of temperance. And there's a sense in which we need to be moderate in what we eat, but really it's also conveying this idea that we need to abstain from things that we know are not good for us. Hmm? And here's the thing, what God does, he begins, he educates us through his word, through health and temperance ministries, we begin to see those things that are not good for us. And then you know what he does? He holds us accountable to it. Hmm? So the other day when I'm making macaroni and cheese for my kids and I tell myself I'm not going to eat any, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> or when I'm walking through the chocolate chip aisle, cookie aisle, and I tell myself I'm not going to eat them. These are, these are not for me. These are for Luke. These are his favorites. <laughs> and before I know it, I'm eating more cookies than him. So when I go to the aisle and I have that conversation with myself, the last two times this week, I put it back on the shelf. Glory be to God, right? <laughs> hmm? So God is calling us to abstaining from things that we know are not good for us, right? 
Then we also need air, fresh air, right? Rest. Hmm? We can go in a whole, we can do a whole seminar on that, right? And then finally, trust in God, right? Really helpful living is all about trusting in God. But the care of the soul temple is not just about living life healthy on earth, but it is ultimately about life in eternity. That is what 1 Corinthians 3, 17 is what he's kind of conveyed. First of all, he's saying if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. This lets us know how seriously God takes the care of our temples. He says, I will destroy the person. In other words, for the person that does not abstain from things that they know to be not good for them. He said, I'm going to hold them accountable. And if they persist, if I convict them that this is sin for them, then I'm going to hold them accountable, right? Hmm? This is how much God cares. But he also shows that this conduct then is not in keeping with his spirit and should be resisted and ruled out of the life of the believer. Anything that is not that is not of God, God is saying that to care for our body, it is to resist those things that are not good for us. Now, I want to make an interesting turn here because Paul really is speaking more than just about health. The temple is defiled not only when we neglect the care of our body, the health of our body, but it is also defiled when we fail to nurture a loving Christian congregation that is free from division and discord. The context of 3 verse 17 right before that is talking about a church that is divided. And the the temple, he says, your temple, he's saying you are the temple. It's in the plural form, meaning that your congregation is the temple of God. And you defile the temple when there is disunity and disharmony in the community of God. And I will destroy you if you are a perpetuator of discord and division. But not only is God, not only is the church the temple of God, but we go and we see, and we're talking about in chapter 6, we go back there. Our soul temple is defiled even when we fail to abstain from sexual intimacy in any form outside of the context of marriage or in any lifestyle that perverts God's original design for our sexuality. We're sinning against our bodies. Hmm? Notice what he says in, in 6 verse 18. Right before he says, do you not know that you're by the temple of the Holy Spirit? He says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. That is really the core of Paul's teaching. The people don't believe that they are sinning against God or that how they treat their bodies, their lifestyle, how they live, has any real eternal implications. Are y'all with me today? I know this is a, it's a hard word, but it's a true word that God wants us to honor his spirit living inside of us. And that means that anything that brings harm to the spirit that lives inside of us is a sin against God. Finally, Paul's deal deals with the motivation for holy living. Notice what he says in verse 20. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. We seek to be healthy 
and live a holy life because we want God to get the glory, not because of vain reasons, not because we want all eyes on us, because we want them to see how Uh, uh, Let me not say that. Because we want them to see how cute we are or how sexy we are. That's not the reason for healthy living. That's not the reason why you go to the gym every morning. (laughs) Hmm? The reason why we take care and we treat our body as a temple, it is because, it is because we realize that God's spirit dwells on the inside and we want him to be glorified. In other words, we want our lives to be in such harmony with him. We want to be in such good health that other people are able to see the character of Jesus living on the inside of us. A healthy lifestyle is a a witness to those who do not know Jesus Christ. A healthy community where there's love and fellowship is a witness to those who don't know Jesus Christ. And so it is, is the person who does not engage in illicit sexual behavior. Glorify God. God is is interested in... In every part of our being. Everything. That's why he says, my last scripture, 10, verse 31, right here in Corinthians. Notice what he says, verse 31. Therefore, chapter 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Hmm? God is interested In every aspect of our lives, everything that we do, every decision that we make, every time we get ready to put something in our bodies, God is concerned. Whatever we do, God says that it should be done not for our own benefit, but for his glory. Now, I want to close with this final point, and I think this is critical Because when we hear about what God's demands is for us, we get, sometimes we feel like that will never happen. Hmm? I could never do that. And you know what? You're right. You can't do it. Not by yourself. I heard a story of this man that was one day, he was walking out in a field and he saw in the distance what appeared to be a farmer, a man who was at a well who was pumping the well. Now he was a couple hundred yards away and this man that he saw in the distance was pumping the well just frantically and he would not stop. And he was pumping the well so hard he thought for sure that the man would stop, take a break, And get tired. And so as he walked towards him, he noticed that the man just kept pumping the well and pumping the well. And he just wouldn't stop. And finally, as he got close to the well where the man was, he realized that it was really not a man after all. It was a machine that was being used to get water out of the well. But it wasn't... The well, the man or the machine pumping the well, it was the well pumping the man. So it is with the Holy Spirit. It's not our work to pump the well. It's the Holy Spirit working on the inside that is the one that is fueling that is controlling, that is pumping us. Let me say it another way, because I don't think y'all get it. For he says in Philippians, Paul says, For it is God who works in you to will. He provides the will to do his good pleasure. 
And so if you want to live your life with nothing off limits to God, holy and acceptable to him, all it means God is calling us to is submission to the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the driving force in our lives. All we need to do is submit to his work in us. Amen? Amen. Who believes the word of God today? Amen. Hmm? Amen. 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 God has ownership over us because he bought us with his life. And he wants us to live for his glory. And so my, my first appeal is this. This is a general appeal. General appeal is that if you want to today say, Lord, I want to live my life wholly committed to you. I want my body to truly be a temple of your Holy Spirit. If this is your desire, I want to invite you to stand to your feet wherever you are today. You recognize God's claim. You want to give him permission today to have full sway in your life. You understand today that the fact that he bought you with his blood means that we should not do anything without his permission. Standing today because you recognize that we cannot do it by ourselves. We need his power his spirit. My second appeal is for the person today who perhaps has never given their heart to Jesus Christ. They hear him speaking to them today. You hear him speaking in your heart today. And you say, Lord, I want all of you and I want you to have all of me. I don't want to hold anything back. I want your spirit to come and live inside my heart. If this is your desire today, I want to invite you, wherever you are, to slip out of your seats, slip out of the aisle, and come down and receive Jesus into your heart. He paid an incredible price for you. You don't have to be a slave to Satan anymore. Christ has redeemed us and he has provided his Holy Spirit so that we can walk in victory. You want to walk in victory today? This is the I want to invite you to come I out of the aisle wherever you are and come and receive him today. This is the
bowed, every eye is closed. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the price that you paid for us. Lord, so many times as believers, we walk in this life not realizing the power of your indwelling spirit living inside of us. We fall into sin, sometimes willingly. Other times we ignore the prompting of your spirit inside of us. We want to live our lives as if we're in charge, doing what we want to do. But Lord, today we see clearly in your word that you have called us to an exclusive relationship where we are completely devoted to you and only you. Lord, I pray today as we stand here today, many of us know the areas in our lives. Some of us, it's our appetite. Some of us, it's, it's in the area of our sexuality. For some of us, it's in the area of our relationships with our brothers and sisters and our families and our marriages. Lord, we know you know exactly where we stand in need of today. What areas of our lives have not been surrendered to you? Lord, you're getting ready to come and you have made us holy and you are calling us to holy living. And so, Lord, may we submit completely to the promptings and the leadings of your Holy Spirit today. May we stand here today, not as a people who will just say, Lord, Lord, we'll just call your name. But don't live our lives submitted to you. Lord, when that great day comes, Lord, I pray that you will recognize us and you will say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, many of us here today need deliverance from our appetites. We normally don't think about appetites like an addiction, like a drug addict. But that's really what it is. We don't think about sin as, as a person being strung out on crack cocaine, but that's really what it is. When we can't stop sinning, when we start doing things against our will, it means that we are in bondage to Satan and we need your power to deliver us. And so God, we come here today. We're standing here today claiming the promises of your power to deliver us and to break every chain in our lives so that we can truly be a temple where you can fully manifest yourself inside of us. May you so fill us that the fragrance of your presence will begin to spill out to the people that we see and that we meet that they will come to want to know the God we serve. We surrender all to you today. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Just before we go to our benediction, um, we want to present our, all of our baptismal candidates, those who have been baptized today, we would like to present them with their um, baptismal certificate. I'd like to invite our interest coordinator, if she could join us on the platform here with us. She's been working with them and the elders. And I'd like to invite all of the baptismal, can I call your name, Sister Leah Jowers. Amen. Sister Jowers, where are you? If you would come. Sister Price, if you could make your way here as well. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sister Lucille Price, amen, amen. She's amen. coming. Amen. Praise the Lord. We want to invite you all to join amen. us at the door as well, if you don't mind. <laughs> amen. Sister Denise Robinson. Sister Darlene McCray and Brother John Drakeford, if they would come at this time. Praise 
praise the Lord. Amen. 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 We want to welcome them. If you see them at the door in the congregation, we just want to welcome them into the fellowship of our congregation. This time, we're going to invite um, Sister Robinson as she comes for our benediction. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Shall we stand for the benediction? <coughs> Bow our heads. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling yes. and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory yes. with exceeding joy. Yes. The only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen.